Uh, welcome. Thank you, everybody, for making it out today. Um, we have an extremely distinguished panel. Um, what's actually interesting to note for each one of these individuals is uh, they actually didn't really need to show up for this entertainment and media panel because each of them have actually a connection more to Demo Day than Web3, but we figured we'll get a two-for-one deal. Um, Joseph John actually, in a past life, before he had the cool hair, was actually a startup IP lawyer, and that's actually how I first met him, was here at Demo Day in Seoul when you were uh, still living up to the Esquire title, yeah. Um, Maggie Chu, um, one of her other many hats that she wears, in addition to um, being one of the co-founders of the Asian Hustle Network, uh, works in fintech. So she has every reason and right to be here for completely different reasons. And last but not least, Brian Pham uh, is actively, maybe borderline aggressively involved in the venture capital space as well. So each one of these members um, have a different but very deep connection to Web3 and to digital and to startups. But the reason we have them here is all three of these uh, individuals for various diverse but arguably very good reasons have decided to kind of stray off their chosen path to dive deep um, into something we call entertainment and media. And each of them have a very distinct and important voice but more importantly today, we want to hopefully share some of their insights and inspirations. So Joseph, uh, ex-lawyer, or still by law, you're still, you can practice if you choose to, now award-winning documentary filmmaker. Um, and I have to say, with Asian Hustle Network, you guys have probably the tightest intro. Like, this was deliberately, I think, designed for an elevator pitch. But I'm literally just going to read right off of their website. Online and offline, super connector for Asian, uh, for creative and entrepreneurial Asians around the world with 200,000 plus community members. Um, who thought of that copy? It's, it's, it's great. Um, it was actually my former uh, chief of staff that came up with that. Okay, well. <laughs> but, um, Neither of us. Yes, so, um, but it's, it's a huge pleasure to have both all three of them up here. And again, um, I'm a big fan of each of their works and um, I follow them vicariously through social media because they're very actively involved. And you guys easily travel way more than I do. And so obviously as you guys were flying into Seoul and you had to write on the form, what were your last three destinations? Joseph, Maggie, Brian, tell us, where were the other three places you visited before you landed here in Seoul? Yep. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. I actually happen to know uh, all three members of the founders of Spark Labs through different capacity, through different <sighs> life stages. Bernard was my college sort of advisor uh, 17 years ago, 16 years ago. And uh, Jimmy and Hanju I, I met when I was working at Kotra as an in-house counsel in New York. Um, but I, the fact that I'm invited has a completely different role this time. Uh, speaks volume as to some of the crazy decisions I guess we all made in, in life uh, to become poorer, at least for me. <laughs> but um, so I just, yeah, I just landed in Korea a week ago. And prior to landing, I traveled across 30 different cities in the U.S. Um, in the past two months uh, to screen my film Chosen, which you guys will watch if you decide to stick around after this panel. Um, so it was Seattle, Boston, and San Francisco. <laughs> that's uh, that's a city that I traveled within just one week span. Wow, your your tour schedule was more impressive than any K-pop act I know of at the moment on the road. Um, and as for Maggie and Brian, um, I understand you guys flew in from uh, Vegas. Is that correct? That's Give us correct. the backstory on Vegas and then two other cities as well. Oh, wow. The backstory on Vegas. So I'm originally from San Francisco. Brian's from L.A. Uh, we recently moved out to Las Vegas about a year ago. And we'll get into the nitty and gritty of what Asian Hustle Network does a little bit later on. But we do a lot of events. And so one of the biggest reasons why we moved out to Vegas is because that is the entertainment capital of the world. Um, the venues are extremely spacious for events. And so that's 
part of the reason why we moved out to Vegas. Uh, as for the last three destinations, it would be Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Seattle, uh, mostly for conferences that we were speaking at and our local events that we were hosting at those cities as well. So I'm Maggie's backup, so I go wherever she needs to go. <laughs> Fair enough. Good answer. Um, now, I'm going to work my way stage right to left or left to right, but um, Brian um, and Maggie, A, how did you guys get together to create Asian Hustle Network? And more importantly, is what was sort of the trigger moment or maybe epiphany event that made you guys decide, you know what, we need to do this? What, what, what happened and why? We always go back and forth like this, like, you go, you go. <laughs> so we take turns. Um, but I would say it was about three years ago when I was working at my corporate job. I was working in tech, uh, doing finance in, and marketing as well. And Brian was a software engineer. And we went to a lot of conferences, meetups, similar to, to this one. Um, and we went to a lot of them in the States. And we would see the same thing over and over again, where there would be a panel of speakers, but none of them were of Asian descent. And we see this with every different industry in the States especially. There's just a lot of underrepresentation for Asians in general. And we thought to ourselves that we wanted to create a community for Asian entrepreneurs and professionals. And the only thing that we thought of was Facebook because Facebook is easily accessible. Everyone has Facebook, it's free. So we created a group on Facebook called the Asian Hustle Network. We made it very clear what the mission of Asian Hustle Network was for, which was a platform for people to join and connect with other Asian entrepreneurs and professionals. You can ask questions, you can give feedback, you can find business partners. Within the first three days, we got to 3,000 members. Within the first three months, it was 30,000. Now it's about three years, almost three years now, and we have over 200,000 members. So a lot of what goes on in the group is finding business partners, seeking advice, partnering up with other people, and there have been a lot of businesses that formed as a result of this group. So we thought, okay, maybe we have something here, right? Maybe this is a movement, maybe this is something that was very much needed within our community. A lot of Asians, we don't really speak up because we just kind of keep to ourselves and not really share what we're going through, our entrepreneurial journey, our hardships. And when people start to speak up about those struggles, a lot of people find commonality and relate to one another. And they, that was kind of like the impetus of, you know, people kind of connecting and finding people who shared similar values and sh similar struggles with each other. So that's kind of the origin story of how Asian Hustle Network started. And Brian, do you want to throw a little bit of a uh, candle on top of that cake? Yeah, I mean, the, a lot of it is this community for the community, right? And for us, it's not really figuring out what the community should be because a lot of people in the community know exactly what it should be. For us, it's about organizing allowing people to express themselves, to invest into each other, to share each other's knowledge, and, and um, really creating a system that, in my opinion, it's like, how do we share information across each other? Because the hardest part about entrepreneurship is access to information, access to people, access to investors, access to mentors. And if we can create that system for people, that's our vision of success. And Joseph, um, what made you decide to walk away from a desk job and go into full-on documentary filmmaking. And again, if you could talk about your first documentary, which, I mean, it was a topic that I didn't even know existed. You went deep on the Korean-Cuban community. Is that correct? Yes, so talk about how you left your desk job. And I, you know, when you were a lawyer, credit where credit's due, I know you never wore a suit, but hypothetically, what made you decide to you know, jump into documentary filmmaking ditch the suit and, and, and uh, go hands-on with the camera? Well, the I irony is uh, I, I never consciously made that decision to change career. Um, I initially believed, so what happened was uh, I was my third year practicing law at Cotra in New York. And one day I decided to pack up and just go on a backpacking trip to Cuba, just cause, to drink rum, to explore a socialist nation to have fun and um, 
you know, I, I went with no plan, so I was going anywhere on a whim, but, you know, the first Cuban I met was this Asian woman taxi driver, just straight out of the airport. And, you know, probability-wise, there's more Chinese than Koreans around the world, right? So I thought, I, I said to her, are you Chinese? And she said, I'm a third-generation Korean Cuban. My grandpa was sold as indentured servant 100 years ago to Mexico. And my dad fought in the Cuban Revolution with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. And he became a vice minister. And I, I said, holy crap, like, I know my life is about to change. <laughs> and it did, because... Uh, Without, you know, unnecessarily getting too much into my personal life, I, I'm a huge uh, believer of this concept of diasporic identity. You know, all of us, we are, if you, you know, speak English, presumably, and you lived across different places around the world, I mean, how do we understand and internalize our identity as someone who lived as a member of diaspora, right? Um, what should our relationship be, uh, me as a Korean American, to my motherland, Korea? And, you know, and I've been traveling to different parts of the world, even when I was practicing attorneys and before during college. And I lived in China, you know, ran into Chosonjok or Korean ethnic Chinese people, and uh, lived in Brazil for a few months. You know, got plugged into the Korean Brazilian community, Korean Germans, Korean South African, Korean Middle Eastern. I mean, you name it. Um, so. You know, that lingering question is almost existential. What does it mean to be a member of Korean diaspora was a very important question. But when I ran into that Korean Cuban, um, whom I didn't know existed, um, I thought it was almost like a religious experience for me. And initially, I went back um, to Cuba after raising funds through Kickstarter, about 20K. Uh, and I brought five friends with me, thinking that I'm going to make a 20-minute YouTube clip on the history of Korean Cubans, but little did I know that became a three-year journey, um, full-time, uh, and it turned into a doc documentary called uh, Heronimo, Geronimo, about Korean Cubans, and it opened in theaters in Korea three years ago in 2019, November 21st. I remember that date very clearly because it's the same day where uh, Frozen 2 opened in theaters. <laughs> so we got murdered at the box office, but. Um, nevertheless, uh, and yeah, one thing led to another. Now I made a second documentary, which is actually opening in theaters uh, this Thursday. It's called Chosen or Cho Chosen. It's about five Korean Americans that ran for U.S. Congress, and um, I'm excited to see where it will take me. I'm going to be your hype man for that film. We're going to show this and screen this at 4:30, so stick around and you'll see what all the hype's all about. Um, the next question I wanted to throw at all of you as well is, um, you know, obviously as you um, decided to uh, step into this journey um, of going into an, uh, entertainment media and becoming a voice for Asian Americans or Asian diaspora, um, obviously at some point you guys probably hit a wall or hit a hardship or went through hell that made you actually think, I should just walk away now. I should just cut my losses. This is too tough, this is too hard. Um, what was that moment? And then on the flip side, did something happen along the way that validated your vision, that made you realize, you know what, I'm doing this for all the right reasons and if I just stick with it, more moments like this will come. So um, yeah, if you could talk about the ups, or in this case, the downs, um, what would they be or when, when, when did it happen or what was it? I guess I'll start. I think for us, starting Asian Hustle Network, the first year was the most difficult because coming from a software engineering background, I didn't know much about creating business models or raising money, right? And for me, I was, I think me and Maggie were just burning through our savings. <laughs> you know, we left our full-time jobs. Uh, we're making pretty good money in San Francisco being a software engineer. That was the hardest part to leave up. So that's part one was leaving the job and going through identity crisis because so much of my identity before was tied to the income that I was making, right? And so much of my own personal self-respect was my income. And so much of my, my parents' respect for me was my income. <laughs> you know, so I left that. I was living off my savings for a good year. And the first year, we're just burning through cash quickly. Living in San Francisco is super expensive. 
And the stupid part before us quitting, the, quitting my job was that I bought a Porsche and I bought a house. <laughs> and then I quit my job. I'm like, wait, it's a terrible idea. What am I doing? <laughs> so the hardest part was definitely running low on money and figuring out that when you're in a desperate situation, what do you do? Do you go back to your job or do you continue this vision that you have, right? And the crazy thing is like when you're in a very dark place and you know that you have to like swing for it, you would do things you would never do. Right? I started subconsciously reaching out to mentors, to reaching out to people that I knew that were raising money, that understood the space, that I could ask about their business models. And slowly, we started to form ideas of how we can, can also create our own business models. Right? The best way that we learned to raise money quickly was having a recurring revenue model, having a paid subscription model. We have 200,000 members that are willing to pay us with the right value proposition that we wanted. We have people who are eager to meet each other, go to events. So we started hosting events around the world. I think we're at 30 events now, plus our annual conference in Las Vegas, which we intend to have. We want to grow to over 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people to come out to our conference to connect Asian entrepreneurs around the world. And the last thing is, I realized that connecting to a lot of people in the community, a lot of people have the money, but they don't have time. And that became the genesis of our, of our fund, right? We realized that People are willing to invest into us and our vision. They trust our decision. And that's the crazy part. Because I remember for me, raising money for the first time, I think I asked somebody for 200,000 USD. And he looked at me, he's like, don't waste my time. Ask for more money. <laughs> I'm like, so it completely blew my mind that if you don't ask, you don't get. You don't put yourself in a position to learn, you won't make it. Um, that's probably my lowest and highest points of creating Asian Hustle Network. I guess a lot to that too. Yes, in the first year, it was really, really hard because when we started Asian Hustle Network, no one really was doing something that we were doing. There are obviously a lot of Asian communities out there, but not one that connects Asian entrepreneurs and creatives specifically, right? And so when people came to us and asked what we did, it was really hard for them to understand how do you make money? How are you going to sustain yourself? How do you become a sustainable company? And when you're dealing with community members, especially entrepreneurs, you're dealing with a lot of hard-headed individuals, a lot of people who have really strong opinions and a lot of people who will tell you how to run your business and how to run your community. So we got a lot of feedback from community members, oh, you should do things like this, you should do things like that. And it was really, really difficult because we were trying to kind of come up with our business model, our business strategy ourselves, and we knew best what that would be, right? But having all of these people come to us, I think it's really important for you to listen to feedback but not take it too seriously. Right, um, And there would be a lot of people who would give us different feedback, and it was just really hard for us to kind of filter through all of that. On top of that, like Brian mentioned, the revenue part of it, it was hard for us to kind of put ourselves in a position where we would be able to ask for people for money because we didn't know how much to value ourselves at, right? And slowly, time after time, you know, after reaching out to sponsors, brand deals, partners, and everything like that, we started to slowly see larger organizations reach out to us. First, we start off with local organizations, local businesses that we could reach out to. Hey, can you sponsor us? Can we have this brand deal with you? And then once we have that on our resume, like Mitch from um, the, the earlier panel mentioned, like if you have a high level person on your resume or if you have a high level, level company on your resume, hey, I partner with this individual, hey, I partner with this company. Then you're able to reach out to bigger organizations, bigger companies, I partner with this person and that person. And they will be able to reach out to you and say like, hey, that's really good on your resume. Like, I wanna be able to you know, partner with you because I don't wanna miss out on that opportunity, right? And so after partnering with these smaller organizations, we start having Comcast reach out to us, Panda Express reach out to us, Facebook reach out to us, Instagram reach out to us, and saying like, we'll pay you money and we'll sponsor you for events, brand deals, everything like that. And I read something earlier or last week saying that if you have organizations or partners that are reaching out to you for brand deals, you are more than likely undervaluing your company. And that's where I realized like, maybe we have something here. You know, These companies are reaching out to us now. When in the first year, we were trying our hardest to reach out to other companies, begging them, hey, can I partner with you? But when these partners reached out to us, that's, how, that's when I realized like, okay, we have a presence here. Before we jump to Joseph, I have a follow-up question for the two of you. 
what you guys just described sounds like literally and figuratively Asians hustling and networking. How did you guys come up with the name Asian Hustle Network? Of all the names you could have plucked and picked out there, why that? I personally like the word hustle, and my mentor kind of gave me that word and kind of engraved it because when we had our full time jobs, we were side hustling, like selling stuff on Amazon, finding things, different ways to make more money, right? So I wanted to build a community around the Asian community because I felt like it was important. I felt like there wasn't enough communities back then three years ago that focused on the Asian community. And if there was, it was all memes, right? So the original, <laughs> original title that I wanted is Asian Hustle. But I tried to buy a domain, and I found out that it's uh, adult websites. Yeah, I was about to mention that because <laughs> if you do a Google search on Asia, Asian Hustle Network, the first thing that pops up at the top is uh, some of the listings might be banned because of it's inappropriate <laughs> for those underage. But thank you for explaining why now. I get it. <laughs> so we had the word network behind it to make it Asian Hustle Network. <laughs> it's duly noted. Okay. And um, Joseph, in terms of your not just personal, but in some ways maybe your personal brand experience, um, you know, with the story arc that you had to go in terms of the lows to the highs to where you're at now. I mean, again, I, look, I studied film. I know how tough it can be. And, you know, God knows there are times where you just want to throw everything at the wall, hoping something sticks. And it's usually probably the kitchen sink and maybe some spaghetti. But where was or when was that low and what helped you rebound? And more importantly, was there a moment, particularly maybe even on this tour, where maybe somebody approached you or said something that just validated what you do and why you do what you do? Well, moments of struggle, that's constant, yeah? Because um, uh, it's financially unreasonable. <laughs> Anyone who wants to make money wouldn't produce documentaries, <laughs> let alone about Korean diaspora. Um, I went to this uh, workshop, career workshop, um, like 10 years ago um, when I was an attorney. One of the uh, really well-known Korean-American uh, designer, so his name is Hong Ko, um, he said something to the effect of, when I make important life decisions, this is his words, uh, I first jump off the cliff and then figure out how to open up the parachute, right? Uh, meaning he always follows his passion first and then figure out the practicalities uh, later. Uh, I'm one of those fools. <laughs> uh, making film wasn't a career choice, it was a passion project. I really wanted to, uh, to, to find out um, how to cope with this identity issue about being Korean American, members of, of Asian Americans, Korean diaspora and all that. Um, but moments of validation is obviously, the reward, uh, reward is so much greater than any, any struggle. So I was, as I was saying, I toured 15 colleges, U.S. colleges, uh, right before I came here, and um, I had multiple occasions where uh, young students would get up during Q&A and say, uh, I've never been seen, I felt like I've never been seen on the screen until I watched Chosen, right? Um, a lot of this Asian diasporic narrative that I, I try to capture um, captures the everyday livelihood of a lot of the immigrant, first generation, second generation stories, um, stories, personal stories. So that's where I find validation and also um, being able to promote this concept of diaspora. I, I really believe in it. Um, what does it mean to be, to have this diasporic identity, diasporic consciousness? Uh, you know, as you guys know, both US and Korea, the politics is a mess. <laughs> I mean, talk about polarization, right? The, the left and the right. And um, I mean, and the ability to, to live uh, in peace, in relative peace in Korea, I, I also find it very problematic, especially the way we treat refugees, a lot of labor migrants, uh, Korean ethnic Chinese, you name it. And I, I try to question, you know, what are some of the uh, moral and philosophical foundation that we can turn to uh, for us to equip ourselves with the idea of living together in peace. And I, I happen to think that the, the stories of the Korean diaspora is, is one that uh, from which we can uh, learn the message because by virtue we're all minorities in the U.S., right? 
I think we, um, whether we are conscious of it or not, we, we know how to coexist in peace with diverse group of people around us. And uh, there's something to be learned from, from that kind of experience. And uh, we're going to roll the questions back this way, but uh, you know, sticking with you, Joseph, is um, you know, during the course of your filmmaking, producing, directing, fundraising, touring, um, along the way, um, were you able to perhaps maybe meet one of your heroes or somebody you really look up to and admired um, that you thought you would maybe never have the chance to meet, but you somehow did? And uh, who would that be? And what was that experience like? Well, um, this morning I showed Chosen at, a, is it Dulwich? Is it Dulwich English British School, um, which is located not just 15 minutes from here. And I presented at Chosen uh, in front of about 100 kids, right? A, a very diverse group of students. Um, I, I spent 50 minutes uh, answering their questions after the film. Uh, and one of whom, his name was David, a little kid, maybe eighth graders. Um, now he came up to me and he said, today is one of the best days in my life. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I meet, you know, my, I don't know, uh, I don't know, Mr. Kang kyung is one that um, came to the screening yesterday and she really blessed uh, the film and the message. I, I get to meet so many people as a result of making film that um, speaks to them at some personal level, but the very idea, and I don't say this with like vanity or pride, but the fact that I can, um, you know, be someone who 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 is who can be of a respectful person to younger kids, whether in college or high school, is also a blessing too. Yeah. And for Maggie and Brian, you know, obviously, you guys um, over the past you know two three years have been able to contact, interview, profile a lot of very important, influential um, Asian American. Asian, um, you know, whether they be political figures, entrepreneurs, and even some celebrities. But uh, did you guys have an opportunity where you had to just kind of keep your fanboy and fangirl giggle on the down low because you were able to meet somebody that you thought you maybe never would have met, but through the Asian Hustle Network, you had that opportunity. And, and what was it like? Was it better than expected, different than expected, or? maybe worse than expected? <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, Bernie, you're absolutely right. Building Asian Hustle Network with Brian, we've been able to interview hundreds of Asian entrepreneurs. And we just surpassed our 200 episode on our Asian Hustle Network podcast. So our Asian Hustle Network podcast, we interview Asian entrepreneurs, professionals, creatives. And I would say the one person that I really admired growing up uh, her name is Michelle Fawn. She is in the makeup and beauty space. She's a makeup guru. And she was one of the first persons that I saw of Asian descent on YouTube. And I thought, you know, I never really get to see a lot of Asians on screen. And when we met her, it was through a virtual event. I never thought that we would have the experience to interview or have these virtual events or in-person events with these idols that I used to grow up with. But the thing is that Yes, like you do have to remain composed. And I think that Brian and I, we've really done a great job at being composed, whether they be, you know, a celebrity or someone that we really look up to. And the really important thing that to note is that if they're a celebrity or someone who is very high level, they will be more open to speaking with you if you are more composed. Because at the end of the day, they are just human beings, just like any of us, right? Um, they started off, you know, probably at the bottom, just like any of us. And they really just want to be respected as a human being. And if you see, if you see them and they see that they're, you're just treating them as a normal human being, they're more open to, you know, just talking with you, you know, asking about what you do and stuff like that. Um, to be honest, like, we really haven't had any bad experiences with a lot of people that we've met. So I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, to answer that question, uh, do you want to shout out to Bernard? He was also on our podcast as well, season one. He doesn't, <laughs> dude, he doesn't count. Come on. <laughs> Someone more famous. <laughs> no, Bernard's pretty famous. Uh, but for me, personally, the, the two people that really stood up my mind is one of the... Well, if you're going to go two, just go three. Go all in. <laughs> all right, uh, three, I guess. Uh, so the first person is probably Justin Kahn, the founder of Twitch. 
I remember driving to work and seeing his billboard of Twitch. I'm like, dude, that guy seems so cool. Like, I want to meet him one day. And then um, what happened was I DM him on, on Instagram, and to my surprise, he's like, Brian, I know who, exactly who you are. I'm like, what the hell? This is crazy. Uh, was that Justin or Adam Justin. Levine? <laughs> <laughs> no. That was Justin Khan, founder of Twitch. Uh, and then we, we had on the podcast. We got to connect. I realized that, you know, contrary to belief, you would think like all these rock star celebrities that speak on stage have some sort of superpower. They have rich parents, whatever, whatever it is. But we got really deep during our podcast, right? He was talking about his struggles with, with Twitch and his mental health and finding a group that he belongs to. And it's crazy because, like, it puts really perspective that, like Maggie said earlier, we're all human beings, right? We're all just looking for purpose. You all, at the end of the day, just want to do something that's very fulfilling and that makes us happy, right? And a lot of these, these founders that we end up meeting, another one is uh, the founder of LinkedIn, so this one's a crazy one. He actually DM'd me on LinkedIn. I'm like, this guy must be a fake profile. <laughs> There's no way the founder on LinkedIn would find time to talk to me right now. So I end up looking him up, clicking his profile. He's legit. I got coffee with him in San Francisco. I asked him, like, what was the inspiration behind LinkedIn? And to my surprise, he was like, I was, he said that a group of friends got him to work on a side project for fun. And that ended up becoming LinkedIn. Right, and a lot of what a lot of what I realized meeting these these cool people is that they like what uh, like Joseph said earlier, they start with a passion project and then figure out the ways to get there, right? And a lot of these founders never intended to create a product that reaches billions of people. It just happened because they're making all the right decisions because they actually care about their user base and their customers and what they're building, what kind of purpose they're solving. Okay, I guess you count Bernard as your number three, so we're good. Bernard is number, <laughs> he's number one, actually. All right. And I have one name. Go that, for it. Yeah, so uh, you guys know Daniel Day Kim? DDK. Yeah, the, yeah DDK, <laughs> the Korean-American actor who was in Lost and so many others. Uh, so our, one of our mutual friends uh, um, sent this screener to uh, DDK uh, for Chosen because Chosen talks about, you know, Asian-American representation in light of uh, both the LA riots, but also the Asian hate crimes. Um, he liked the film so much so that, that he wanted to uh, represent us in negotiating with Netflix, Apple, Disney, and uh, Amazon. Uh, and to make the long story short, after four months of hard negotiation, everything fell, fell through. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, to, to get a, an endorsement from someone like DDK was, was quite magical, for sure. It's amazing. We're going to wrap up soon, so I'm going to um, ask you both, uh, all three of you, uh, one last question. Um, your next projects and your dream project, what would that be? Maggie, why don't we start with you? Next projects. I, so, I mean, Brian and I, we're going to be spending some time in Asia. Um, so one of our biggest projects that we're focusing on right now is we obviously started in the United States on the West Coast, and that is our largest demographic, but there are so many Asian entrepreneurs in Asia, obviously. And so what we're trying to do is expand Asian Hustle Network into Asia, starting with Southeast Asia, um, and localizing all of our content. So that's something that we're really focusing and honing down on right now. Uh, in terms of our dream project, I think I'll let, I'll let Brian kind of speak to our dream project. Yeah, I don't know if this is dream or not because we, we put it into motion. So what we want to create is like an Asian TED Talk of the world, right? And what we want to do is invite entrepreneurs from every single country, Korea, Vietnam, China, Taiwan, wherever. We want them to come on stage and share to us their entrepreneur journey. Because what's cool about what we do is that we meet entrepreneurs around the world. We realize that we're all very, very similar. Like the way we think, the way we want to look, get product market fit. And we're looking to have translation of that knowledge in, in every single Asian language. Because our vision is that we've, we realize that Asians, entrepreneurs around the world, do not talk to each other. Like we realize that Asian United States don't talk, only talk to each other, Asian Australia, Canada, Korea, whatever. But like, how do we connect this ecosystem, this vast knowledge that everybody has to each other? And that's one of the biggest visions that we have. So going back to Web3 and DAO, so from a nonprofit perspective, we have a nonprofit arm, but what we realize um, is that a lot of these transactions are not very transparent. 
right? Every time you make a donation to a nonprofit, they say they're going to do this, that, this, and that. I think that there's a better way to do it, right? And one way that we're looking at is obviously looking at the DAO. Right? The DAO offers transparency. A lot of times I, when I make my donations, I want to know where the money is going. A lot of times I make a $10,000 whatever donation, and I realize a year later, I'm like, I wonder if my money went to the right place, <laughs> you know? And the crazy thing, and this is just my opinion too, and the crazy thing, crazy thing about the nonprofit world is that a lot of times it ends up becoming a tax haven for a lot of wealthy individuals to write their tax donations to, and then again, you don't know where the money's going. And you realize that a lot of these, these nonprofit CEOs actually paid themselves a lot of money, right? So I want to be, create a system where we have a good cause, we have a problem that we're trying to solve, and the community understands where the money is going and how the problem is being solved. The last thing that we're working on is uh, we already launched our venture fund in the US. Uh, it's about $20 million fund. So we're looking to launch uh, a few more. So we just recently incorporated in Australia and Singapore, uh, which allow us to invest into you guys, right? Invest into our community. Uh, a lot of people come to our community asking the same questions. How do I find mentors? How do I find investments? Uh, we realized the best way to solve the problem is to have a venture fund because when we get our high level LPs to invest, a lot of them want to be mentors <laughs> to these newer people and to create access to each other, right? A lot of these LPs, uh, the biggest request they have is please don't share my contact to everybody in your community. I don't want like 100,000 emails coming into my inbox, right? If you can create a list of cohorts, we'll be willing to dedicate time, energy to mentoring them. And that's kind of like the system that I mentioned earlier that we're trying to build and solve all these problems within our own community. Okay, and Joseph? Can you invest into my future projects? <laughs> We're talking, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I met this uh, uh, doctor, Korean American doctor uh, in Chicago about a couple months ago. He uh, he works in North Korea. Uh, he treats kids kids with disabilities, um, and he tells me that he runs an eight weeks uh, physical therapy course for kids with disabilities and their parents. And every session, he sees this remarkable. Uh, restoration of human relationship between the kids and the parents. So he um, he said, would you like to film me? And I said, if you can get me into North Korea, I'd love to go and film and make a documentary out of you. So that's my dream project. And is that also your next project as well? Uh, it's not set in motion because North Korea uh, is still under sanction. And uh, I can't, as a U.S. citizen, I can't get into North Korea, but hopefully one day soon. And, and after you wind down sort of your promotions for Chosen, um, do you have something else lined up as well? Uh, not at the moment. I mean, a lot of really hinges on the, the success of the theatrical run in Korea. Um, once it opens in theaters this Thursday, as some of you guys might know, independent documentaries, if you don't do well in the box office the first week, the, the film goes down the second week, right? So um, even if you actually get to watch the film today, if you like it, I would ask you <laughs> to bring your families and friends over the, over the weekend. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna open the floor to any questions that anybody might have out there. So anybody have any questions? Yes, no, maybe? Any hands? You asked me my favorite color too, you know. Okay, I think we'll, oh, here we go. So you mentioned uh, you guys started monetizing by getting sponsorships and brand deals. Could you just share with us the first one that you got that was significant for your growth of agent? Ooh, that's a good question. I should have asked that. Thank you. <laughs> so that's a really, really good question. I think at the very beginning, we kind of really undersold ourselves. Like, we're scared to ask for $500 to $1,000. Uh, but when... Maggie and I were just really testing the waters. We asked, what is it, Kia? We asked Kia for $45,000 for one Instagram post, and they said, okay. <laughs> and that's when we realized that, oh, but okay was very fast. There was no hesitant meaning behind it. And we realized that if you could go out and ask like five different brands a month, we make over like 200, 300,000. That's why not do that. You said <laughs> IKEA or Kia? Kia. 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 
the Korean car brand. Yeah, the yes. Korean car brand. Yeah. And at that time, they were rebranding, so they were trying to get a bunch of these promotions out. And just to keep in mind, a lot of these big corporations, conglomerates, they have a budget every year for sponsorships and brand deals. And if they don't spend that by the end of the fiscal year, they can't roll it over. So normally by like December, they're like rushing to get all of these budget dollars out by the end of the year. Well, the perfect time to like ask for sponsorship dollars, in our opinion, it's like right before fall. So like October around this time, because as you go into the next year, if you don't spend the marketing dollar, they lose it. The department lose it. So they have to spend it. They're motivated to spend it. Any any other questions? Okay, I think. Oh, another one. Go for it. Just to also ask um, Joseph, uh, I've heard of third culture kids. Well, I guess you basically are third culture kid, but going to like the dullest student. Or I think it would be interesting as the next project idea that you consider is um, in the late in the 80s and 90s when the Korean government started saying, all right, let's send all our Korean companies, channels across the world. I think those strategies could be interesting. Um, you know. The sky is the limit. There are so many stories out there, for sure. Thank you. Oh, one more. Oh, we got more questions. Go for it. course yeah for sure <laughs> I'm not a critic <laughs> I'm a fellow filmmaker um, I will tell you this uh, I'm not lying um, I had a few audience members uh, in different cities who tell me that your film was better than Minari <laughs> Ooh. You can be the judge. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we'll wrap it up here. If anybody has any questions, um, all three of these speakers will be out and about not only today, but over the next few days during demo day. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing a B1 world premiere of Chosen in, in just a few moments. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you.